Welcome to CNN's Republican presidential debate. No topic perhaps has been more combustible in this campaign than the issue of immigration. Mr. Trump, you have called for deporting every undocumented immigrant. Governor Christie has said, quote, there are not enough law enforcement officers, local, county, state, and federal combined to forcibly deport 11 to 12 million people. Tell Governor Christie how much your plan will cost and how you will get it done. Correct. First of all, I want to build a wall, a wall that works. So important, and it's a big part of it. Second of all, we have a lot of really bad dudes in this country from outside, and I think Chris knows that maybe as well as anybody. They go, if I get elected, first day, they're gone. Gangs all over the place, Chicago, Baltimore, no matter where you look. We have a country based on laws. I will make sure that those laws are adhered to. These are illegal immigrants. I don't think you'd even be asking this question if I didn't run. Because when I ran and I brought this up, at my opening remarks at Trump Tower, I took heat like nobody has taken heat in a long time. And then they found out with the killing of Kate from San Francisco and so many other crimes, they found out that I was right. And most people, many people apologized to me. I don't think you'd even be talking about illegal immigration if it weren't for me. So we have a country of laws. They're going to go out and they'll come back if they deserve to come back. If they've had a bad record, if they've been arrested, if they've been in jail, they're never coming back. We're going to have a country again. Right now, we don't have a country, we don't have a border, and we're going to do something about it. And it can be done with proper management, and it can be done with heart. Governor Christie, you and I have talked about this in an interview. You say that his big wall, his plan to deport 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants, it sounds great but it's never going to happen. Tell them why you're skeptical of his plans. Well, first off, Jake, I don't yield to anybody on how to enforce the law. I'm the only person on the stage who spent seven years as the United States attorney after September 11th. And I know how to do this. The fact is, though, that for 15,000 people a day to be deported every day for two years is an undertaking that almost none of us could accomplish given the current levels of funding and the current number of law enforcement officers. But here's what we need to do, and I think this is where Donald is absolutely right. What we need to do is to secure our border, and we need to do it with more than just a wall. We need to use electronics, we need to use drones, we need to use FBI, DA, and ATF, and yes, we need to take the fingerprint of every person who comes into this country on a visa, mm -hmm. and when they overstay their visa, we need to tap them on the shoulder and say, you have overstayed your welcome, you are taking advantage of the American people, it's time for you to go. If we had that kind of system in place, we wouldn't have the 11 million people we have now. Thank you, Governor Christie. Uh, By the way, I agree, with, I agree with what Chris is saying, uh, but I will say this, illegal immigration is costing us more than $200 billion a year just maintaining what we have. I, I want to bring in Dr. Carson because he too has been skeptical of your plan to immediately okay. deport 11 to 12 million uh, illegal immigrants. He said, quote, people who say that have no idea what this entails. Why do you say that, Dr. Carson? Well, first of all, recognize that we have an incredible illegal immigration problem. I was uh, down in Arizona a few weeks ago at the border. I mean, the fences that were there were not manned and those are the kind of fences when I was a kid that would barely slow us down. So I don't see any purpose in having that. Now what we need to do is look at something that actually works. Yuma County, Arizona, they stopped 97% of the illegal immigration through there. They put in a double fence with a road so that there was quick access by the enforcement people. Uh, if we don't seal the border, the rest of the stuff really doesn't matter. It's, it's kind of ridiculous, all the other things that we talk about. We have the ability to do it. We don't have the will to do it. There was one area where they had cut a hole in the fence, and to prepare it, they put a few strands of barbed wire across. Well, the photographers who were there with us, they wanted to photograph us from the side of the Mexicans, and they went through there, and they were not physically fit people, and they took their cameras and things with them and shot us from the other side. That's how easy it is to get across. And the drugs, I mean, it goes on and on and on. ICE tells them to release these people. 67,000 criminals released Dr. Onto Carson, our property. It's ridiculous. It's with, all, with all due respect, Dr. Carson, you said about Donald Trump's plan to immediately deport 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants. People who say that have no idea what this entails. Why not? 
Well, I have also said, if, if anybody knows how to do that, uh, that I would be willing to listen. And if they can, uh, you know, specify exactly how that's going to be done and what the cost, and it sounds reasonable, then I think uh, it's worth discussing. And, but and let's, David, let's continue uh, the conversation about illegal immigration with Dana Bash. Governor Bush, Mr. Trump has suggested that your views on immigration are influenced by your Mexican-born wife. He said that, quote, if my wife were from Mexico, I think I would have a soft spot for people from Mexico. Did Mr. Trump go too far in invoking your wife? He did. He did. Um, you're proud of your family, just as I am, Correct. to subject my wife into the middle of a raucous political conversation was completely inappropriate. And I hope you apologize for that, Donald. Well, I have to tell you, I hear phenomenal things. I hear your wife is a lovely woman. She is. I she's don't fantastic. know her. And this she is, is a total absolutely the love of my life. And she's right here. And why don't Good. you apologize Good. for her? No, I won't right do that now. because I said nothing yeah. wrong. But I do hear so she's a lovely woman. So here's the deal. My wife is a Mex Mexican-American. She's an American by choice. She loves this country as much as anybody in this room. And she wants a secure border, but she wants to embrace the traditional American values that make us special and make us unique. We're at a crossroads right now. Are we going to take the Reagan approach, the hopeful, optimistic approach, the approach that says that you come to our country legally, you pursue your dreams with a vengeance, you create opportunities for all of us, or the Donald Trump approach? The approach that Anna. says that everything is bad, that everything is coming to an end. I, Mr. Trump, I'm Jeb on the Reagan side of this. That they come into our country as an act of love. With all of the problems that we have in so many instances, we have wonderful people coming in. But with all of the problems, this is not an act of love. He's weak on immigration. By the way, in favor of Common Core, which is also a disaster. <laughs> but weak on immigration, he doesn't get my vote. Dana, with Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, Trump, immigration did not come up in 2016 because Mr. Trump brought it up. We talked about it in 2012. We talked about it in 2008. We talked about it in not 2004. With this I, we have been talking about it for 25 years. This is Ms. why Fiorina, people are tired Ms. Fiorina, of politicians. We're going to we're gonna come to you. I just want to get Governor Bush a, a chance to respond to what Mr. Trump Look, said. Look, first of all, I wrote a book about this uh, three, four years ago now. And I laid out a comprehensive conservative approach for immigration reform. And it does require securing the border. No one disagrees with that. But to build a wall and to deport people half a million a month would cost hundreds of billions of dollars, Donald. Hundreds of billions of dollars. It would destroy community life. It would tear families apart. And it would send a signal to the rest of the world that the United States Mr. values that are so this. important for our long-term success no longer matter in this country. As I said, we are spending $200 billion. We are spending $200 billion a year on maintaining what we have. We will move them out. The great ones will come back. The good ones will come back. They'll be expedited. So They'll be back. They'll come back legally. We'll have a country. They'll come back legally. Okay, on that note, you have criticized Governor Bush for speaking Spanish on the campaign trail. You said, quote, he should really set an example by speaking English in the United States. What's wrong with speaking well, Spanish? Well, I think it's wonderful and all, but I did it a little bit half-heartedly, but I do mean it to a large extent. We have a country where, to assimilate, you have to speak English. And I think that where he was and the way it came out didn't sound right to me. We have to have assimilation. To have a country, we have to have assimilation. I'm not the first one to say this, Dana. We've had many people over the years, for many, many years, saying the same thing. This is a country where we speak English, not Spanish. Well, I'm, I've been speaking English here tonight, and I'll keep speaking English, but the simple fact is if a, college, if a high school kid asked me a question in Spanish, a, a, a school, by the way, a voucher program that was created under my watch, the largest voucher program in the country where kids can go to a Christian school and they ask me a question in Spanish, I'm going to show respect and answer that question in Spanish, Dana. even though they do speak English and even though they embrace American values. This was a reporter, not a high school kid, by the way. Dana, I, I, I agree that English is the unifying language of our country and everyone should learn to speak it. It's important. I want to tell you a story about someone that didn't speak English that well. It was my grandfather. He came to this country in the 1960s as a escaping Cuba. And he lived with us growing up. And my grandfather loved America. He understood what was so special about this country. He loved Ronald Reagan. He would be very proud of the fact that we're here this evening. My grandfather instilled in me the belief that I was blessed to live in the one society in all of human history where even I, the son of a bartender and a maid, 
could aspire to have anything and be anything that I was willing to work hard to achieve. But he taught me that in Spanish because it was the language he was most comfortable in. And he became a conservative even though he got his news in Spanish. And so I do give interviews in Spanish and here's why. Because I believe that free enterprise and limited government is the best way to help people who are trying to, who are trying to achieve upward mobility. And if they get their news in Spanish, I want them to hear that directly from me, not from a translator at Univision. Thank you, Senator Rubio. <laughs> Senator Cruz. Senator Cruz. This week we learned more about Dr. Carson's plan for the 11 to 12 million undocumented immigrants in this country. Dr. Carson proposed giving these undocumented immigrants a six month grace period to pay back taxes, then to let them become guest workers, and only to deport people who fail to do that. Not exactly Under what your, I said. Well, how would you say it, sir? I was just reading the Wall Street Journal quote, but please tell us. Well, what I said, after we sell the borders, after we turn off the spigot that dispenses all the goodies so we don't have people coming in here including employment that people who had a pristine record we should consider allowing them to become guest workers primarily in the agricultural sphere because that's the place where Americans don't seem to want to work that's what I said and they have a six month period to do that if they don't do it within that time period then they become illegal and as illegals, they will be treated as such. Okay, from the horse's mouth. Senator Cruz, does that fit your definition of amnesty? Well, Jake, you know, I'm, I'm very glad that Donald Trump's being in this race has forced the mainstream media finally to talk about illegal immigration. I think that's very important. I like and respect Ben Carson. I'll let him talk about his own plans. But I will say this, the natural next question that primary voters are asking after we focus on illegal immigration is, okay, what are the records of the various candidates? And this is an issue on which there are stark differences. A majority of the men and women on this stage have previously and publicly embraced amnesty. I am the only candidate on this stage who has never supported amnesty and, in fact, who helped lead the fight to stop a massive amnesty plan in 2013 when Barack Obama and Harry Reid joined the Washington Republicans in a massive amnesty plan. I stood shoulder to shoulder with Jeff Sessions helping lead the fight. You know, folks here have talked about how do you secure the borders. Well, I've been leading the fight in the Senate to triple the border patrol, to put in place fencings and walls, to put in place a strong biometric exit entry Thank system. You, Senator. Senator Rubio, uh, can I, can I'm not sure exactly, we'll, we'll come back to you in one second, sir, yeah. but Senator Rubio, I'm not sure exactly whose plan he's, he, he's saying as, as constitutes amnesty, but I know yeah. he has said it about your plan in the past, so I want to give you a chance to respond. Then Dr. Carson will come to you. Okay. Well, let me say that uh, legal immigration is not an issue I read about in the newspaper. Immigration, illegal immigration, all the good aspects of immigration, and all the negative ones as well, I live with. My family's immigrants. My neighbors are all immigrants. My in-laws are all immigrants. So I've seen every aspect of it. And I can tell you America doesn't have one immigration problem. It has three. First, despite the fact that we are the most generous country in the history of the world on allowing people to come here legally, we have people still coming illegally. Second, we have a legal immigration system that no longer works. It primarily is built on the basis of whether or not you have a relative living here instead of merit. And third, we have 11 or 12 million people, many of whom have been here for longer than a decade, who are already here illegally. And we must deal with all three of these problems. We cannot deal with all the three of these problems in one massive piece of legislation. I learned that. We tried it that way. Here's the way forward. First, we must. We must secure our border, the physical border with, or the wall, absolutely. But we also need to have an entry-exit tracking system. 40% of the people who come here illegally come illegally. And then they overstay the visa. We also need a mandatory E-Verify system. After we've done that, step two would be to modernize our legal immigration system. So you come to America on the basis of what you can contribute economically, not whether or not simply you have a relative living here. And after we've done those two things, I believe the American people you, will be sir. very reasonable and responsible about what you do with someone who's been here and isn't a criminal. If you're a criminal, obviously you will not be able to stay. Thank you, Senator. Senator, uh, Dr. Carson, I want to give you 30 seconds. I'd like you to answer the question. Senator Cruz describes plans such as yours as amnesty. Why is your plan not amnesty? My plan is not amnesty for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, I've talked to farmers and they said they cannot hire Americans to do the kind of job that I'm talking about. And uh, 
The second reason is because the individuals who register as guest workers, they don't get the vote, they are not American citizens, and they don't get the rights and privileges of American citizens. So that's key. But the other thing that I want to bring up is I mentioned something earlier. I think it was just sort of glossed over. I talked about the success in Yuma County. I mean, incredible success. And the Department of Justice said, no, we don't want to do that. That's too successful. We don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. All we have to do is look at things that work. All we have to do is use a little Thank common sense. Thank you, Dr. Sense. Carson. I want to talk about the issue of birthright citizenship, which has emerged since the first debate as, as in a, a major issue uh, in this campaign. Mr. Trump, you say that babies born in the United States to undocumented immigrants should not any longer get automatic American citizenship. Ms. Fiorina says that you are pandering on this issue and acting like the politicians that you rail against. What's your message to Ms. Fiorina on birthright citizenship? Well, first of all, the, the 14th Amendment says very, very clearly to a lot of great legal scholars, not television scholars, but legal scholars, that it is wrong. It can be corrected with an act of Congress, probably doesn't even need that. A woman gets pregnant. She's nine months. She walks across the border. She has the baby in the United States, and we take care of the baby for 85 years. I don't think so. And by the way, Mexico and almost every other country anywhere in the world doesn't have that. We're the only ones dumb enough, stupid enough to have it. And people, and by the way, this is not just with respect to Mexico. They're coming from Asia to have babies here, and all of a sudden we have to take care of the babies for the life of the baby. The 14th Amendment, it reads properly, you can go, and it's probably going to be have to check, go through a process of court, probably ends up at the Supreme Court, but there are a lot of great legal scholars that say that is not correct. And in my opinion, it makes absolutely no, we're the only, one of the only countries, we're going to take care of those babies for 70, 75, 80, 90 years? I don't think so. Ms. Fiorina, the vast majority of countries do not have birthright citizenship. Donald Trump is right about that. Why is it pandering when he says this? First, let me say, we have just spent a good bit of time discussing as Republicans how to solve this problem. I would ask your audience at home to ask a very basic question. Why have Democrats not solved this problem? President Obama campaigned in 2007 and 2008 on solving the immigration problem. He entered Washington with majorities in the House and the Senate. He could have chosen to do anything to solve this, pro this problem. Instead, he chose to do nothing. Why? Because the Democrats don't want this issue solved. Ms. They want it to be an issue Ms. that they can use. Ms. As to birthright citizenship, Please. the truth is you can't just wave your hands and say the 14th Amendment is going to go away. It will take an extremely arduous vote in Congress, followed by two-thirds of the states, and if that doesn't work to amend the Constitution, then it is a long, arduous process in court. And meanwhile, what will continue to go on is what has gone on for 25 years. With all due respect, Mr. Trump, we have been talking about illegal immigration for 25 years. San Francisco has been a sanctuary city since 1989. There are 300 of them. And meanwhile, what has happened? Nothing. The border remains insecure. The legal immigration system remains broken. Look, we know what it takes to secure a board. We've heard a lot of great ideas here. Money, manpower, Thank technology, you, mostly apparently leadership, Thank the you. kind of leadership that understands how to get results. Thank you, Ms. Fiorina. Mr. Trump, I, I want to give you a chance to respond. By the way, with Carly on the fact that the Democrats do not want to solve this problem for the obvious reasons, but they do not. But I believe that a reading of the 14th Amendment allows you to have an interpretation where this is not legal and where it can't be done. I've seen both sides, but mm -hmm. some of the greatest scholars agree with me without having to go through Congress. If you do go through Congress, you can absolutely solve Thank the problem. Thank you, Mr. Trump. You, you would Senator stipulate, Paul. Mr. Trump, that not everyone agrees with you. That's true. Sure. Senator okay. Paul, I want to bring you in. Where, where do you stand on the issue of birthright citizenship? Well, I hate to say it, but Donald Trump has a bit of a point here. Uh, the case that was decided around 1900 was people had a green card, were here legally, and they said that their children were citizens. There's never been a direct Supreme Court case on people who are here illegally, whether or not their kids are citizens. So it hasn't really been completely adjudicated. The 14th Amendment says that those who were here and under the jurisdiction 
The original author of the, of the 14th Amendment said on the Senate floor that this was applying to slaves and did not specifically apply to others. All right, Senator Paul, thank you so much. Let's turn to a new topic. We've received a lot of questions on social media about the economy and about jobs. We have two CEOs on stage right now. Ms. Fiorina, you were CEO of Hewlett Packard. Donald Trump says you, quote, ran HP into the ground. You laid off tens of thousands of people. You got viciously fired. For voters looking to somebody with private sector experience to create American jobs, why should they pick you and not Donald Trump? I led Hewlett Packard through a very difficult time, the worst technology recession in 25 years. The NASDAQ stock index fell 80%. It took 15 years for the stock index to recover. We had very strong competitors who literally went out of business and lost all of their jobs in the process. Despite those difficult times, we doubled the size of the company, we quadrupled its top line growth rate, we quadrupled its cash flow, we tripled its rate of innovation. Yes, we had to make tough choices. And in doing so, we saved 80,000 jobs, went on to grow to 160,000 jobs, and now Hewlett Packard is almost 300,000 jobs. We went from lagging behind to leading in every product category and every market segment. We must lead in this nation again, and some tough calls are going to be required. But as for the firing, I have been very honest about this from the day it happened. When you challenge the status quo, you make enemies. I made a few. Steve Jobs told me that when he called me the day I was fired to say, hey, been there, done that twice. It's also true that the man that led my firing, Tom Perkins, just Thank took you, out Governor. a full page ad in the New York Times to say he was wrong, I was right, Thank I was you. a terrific CEO, the board was dysfunctional, and he thinks I will make a magnificent president you, of Ms. the United Fiorina. States. Well, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, why would you be better at creating let, let jobs just, than Carly Fiorina? Well, let me just explain. The head of the Yale Business School, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, wrote a paper recently, one of the worst tenures for a CFO, CEO that he has ever seen, ranked one of the top 20 in the history of business. The company is a disaster and continues to be a disaster. They still haven't recovered. In fact, today, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, they fired another 25 or 30,000 people, saying we still haven't recovered from the catastrophe. When Carly says the revenues went up, that's because she bought Compaq. It was a terrible deal, and it really led to the destruction of the company. Now, one other company before that was Lucent. Carly was at Lucent before that. And Lucent turned out to be a catastrophe also. So I only say this, she can't run any of my companies. That I can tell you. <laughs> Ms. Fiorina, you know, I want to give you a chance uh, to respond. Jeffrey Sonnenfeld is a well-known Clintonite and honestly headed out for me from the moment that I arrived at Hewlett Packard. But honestly, Mr. Trump, I find it qu quite rich that you would talk about this. You know, there are a lot of us Americans who believe that we are going to have trouble someday paying back the interest on our debt because politicians have run up mountains of debt using other people's money. That, that is, in fact, precisely the way you read ran your casinos. You ran up mountains of debt as well as losses using other people's money, and you were forced to file for bankruptcy not once, I never not twice, bankruptcy. four times times, a record four times. Why should we trust you Mr. to manage the finances of this nation you, any differently than you manage running, the finances Carly, of your casinos? Carly, Carly, Mr. Trump. I made over $10 billion. I had a casino company. Caesars just filed for bankruptcy. Um, Chris will tell you, it's not Chris's fault either, but almost everybody in Atlantic City is either in trouble or filed for bankruptcy. Maybe I'll blame Chris. Well, but, but Mr. Atlantic Mr. City Mr. Trump is also a disaster. Wait a minute, Carly. Wait. I'll let you speak. Atlantic City is a disaster, and I did great in Atlantic City. I knew when to get out, my timing was great, and I got a lot of credit for it. Many of the great business people that you know, and Carl Icahn's going to work with me on making great deals for this country, but whether it's Carl or so many others that we read about all the time, Thank you, Mr. they Trump. have used the laws hey, of the land, hey, which are the best. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, 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 so Governor Christie's name has been invoked. Yeah. I'd like to give him the 30 second Chick, opportunity. Listen, while I'm as entertained as anyone, by this personal back and forth about the history of Donald and Carly's career. For the 55-year-old construction worker out in that audience tonight who doesn't have a job, who can't fund his child's education, i got to tell you the truth. They could care less about your careers. They care about theirs. Let's start talking about that on this stage. And stop playing, and stop playing the games. Governor stop Jay, there's, there's a, John, I'm not done yet, John. A track Sorry. record of stop, leadership and is and not stop, a game. And stop it is playing, the issue in Carly, this election. Carly, listen, you can interrupt everybody else on this stage. You can interrupt me. Okay? The fact is that 
we don't want to hear about your careers back and forth and volleying back and forth about who did well and who did poorly. You're both successful people. Congratulations. You know who's not successful? The middle class in this country who's getting plowed over by Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Let's start talking about those issues tonight and stop this childish back and forth between the two of you. Ms. Jake, Fiorina, I, I want to give you... Jake. Governor there's, Kasich, I'm coming to you next, but well, Ms. I, Ms. Fiorino's name was mentioned, and I have to give her the opportunity to respond if she wants it. Well, I thought we had been hearing quite a bit about Governor Christie's record as governor, actually. I think track records are very important. I completely agree that what's at stake here is the future of this nation and the future of every American. But I do think that a track record of leadership is vital because in the end, this election is about leadership. And let's talk about what leadership is. It's not about braggadocio. It is about challenging the status quo, solving problems, producing results, and the highest calling of leadership is to unlock potential in others. Thank you. Problems have festered in Washington for too long, and the potential of this nation is being crushed. Thank you, Ms. Fiorina. Governor Kasich, Jake. I want to come to you. I want to, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Let me ask the question. You can use it the time however you want. Okay, Jay. Donald <laughs> Trump says that the hedge fund guys are getting away with murder by paying a lower tax rate. He wants to raise the taxes of hedge fund managers, as does Governor Bush. Do you agree? I, I don't at this point in terms of changing the incentives for investment and risk taking, but let's just stop for a second. There's one person on this stage that does have a record. I'm the only person on the stage and one of the few people in this country that led the effort as the chief architect of the last time we balanced the federal budget. We also cut taxes. And when I left Washington in 2000, we had a $5 trillion surplus and the economy was booming. I'd spent 10 year, years of my life to get us to that point went out in the private sector, it was a great experience, and went into Ohio and took an $8 billion hole and turned it into a $2 billion surplus. We've had the largest amount of tax cuts of any sitting governor. We have grown well over 300,000 jobs. You see, I've done it in both places. I'm the only one here that's done it in both places. It took a lot to get us to a balanced budget. It was legitimate, it was real, and we negotiated it. A lot of what we're talking about here tonight is I'm going to take this position and that position. You know what? At the end of the day, America's got to work. We've got to figure out how we come together to deal with, this, with our fiscal problems, because when we deal with that, we create a stronger econo economy for everybody. People have a chance to rise. So, you know, when we think about how we make a choice, it's the person that lands that plane. It's not somebody that talks about it. It's about the person who's done it. And I've done Thank it you, in Governor. both places. And I did it, including people in the other party, and that's how we were successful, you, and that's how I will be president, Governor, using that experience to drive this country forward. Governor Thank Huckabee, you. I want to bring you in on the question of uh, ta pen, um, hedge fund managers and taxing them. You have said uh, that you are bothered by the fact that hedge fund managers pay such a low tax rate and make 2,500 times uh, what people who work for them make. Uh, do you agree with what Donald Trump and Governor Bush have proposed, raising their tax rates? I have a different idea. I think we ought to get rid of all the taxes on people who produce. Why should we penalize productivity? And it's why I'm an unabashed supporter of the fair tax, which would be a tax on our consumption rather than a tax on our productivity. In other words, you're not going to tax anybody for what they earn, whether it's a worker who's working by the hour or whether it's a hedge fund manager if they can produce something and bring capital and labor to create jobs we need some jobs and i think the fair tax makes more sense now jake i've been listening to everybody on the stage and there's a lot of back and forth about i'm the only one who's done this the only one who's done that i've done great things we've all done great things or we wouldn't be on this stage but it occurs to me as we're sitting here in the reagan library that most of us would like to pay tribute to a guy who, when he got elected, didn't get elected telling everybody how great he was. He got elected telling everybody how great the American people were, and he empowered them to live their dreams, which is what I'd love to see us do by no longer penalizing the people who are out there working, because they're taking a gut punch right now. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Dr. Carson. Dr. Carson, you support scrapping the entire tax code and replacing it with a flat tax based on the principle of tithing from the Bible. If you make $10 billion, you pay $1 billion in taxes. If you make $10, you pay $1 in taxes. Donald Trump believes in progressive taxation. He says it's not right that rich people pay the same as the poor. 
tell Donald Trump why his ideas on taxes are wrong. It's all about America. You know, the people who say the guy who paid a billion dollars because he had 10, he's still got $9 billion left. That's not fair. We need to take more of his money. That's called socialism. That doesn't work so well. What made America into a great nation was the fact that we said, that guy just put in a billion dollars. Let's create an environment that's even more conducive to his success so that next year he can put in $2 billion. And that's the kind of thing that helps us to grow. We can't grow by continuing to take a piece of pie and dividing it and redistributing it. But I'm also looking at uh, what Dr. Huck, but what uh, Governor Huckabee talked about. You don't uh, want me the, operating on you, I assure <laughs> you that. The fair tax. Looking at both of them, uh, we're evaluating them both, and I'm talking to the American people. Because one of the things we must recognize is that this country is of, for, and by the people. And it's really time that the government get out of the way and let the people be the ones who decide how they want to run their country. Mr. Trump, what do you think of the flat tax? Do you think it's fair? Well, I, I think the thing about the flat tax, I know it very well, that I don't like is if you make uh, $200 million a year, you pay 10%, you're paying very little relatively to somebody that's making $50,000 a year and has to hire H&R Block to do the work because it's so complicated. One thing I'll say to Ben is that we've had a graduated tax system for many years, so it's not a socialistic thing. What I'd like to do is, and I'll be putting in the plan in about two weeks, and I think people are going to like it, it's a major reduction in taxes. It's a major reduction for the middle class. The hedge fund guys won't like me as much as they like me right now. I know them all, but they'll pay more. I know people that are making a tremendous amount of money and paying virtually no tax, and I think it's unfair. Thank you, Mr. Trump. Uh, Senator Paul. Well, I'm glad we're having a discussion about taxes because everybody laments that we lose jobs overseas. Well, yeah, our, our companies and our jobs are being chased overseas by a 70,000-page tax code. So that's why I've chosen to get rid of the whole thing and have one single rate, 14.5% for everybody, business and for uh, corporate, in, corporate income and personal income. But we also get rid of the payroll tax, so the working class would get a tax break as well. So I think a flat tax, eliminating the tax code, getting rid of all the loopholes is the way to go, and it's the way we get America going again. Governor Walker, I want to go to yeah. you. Uh, Dr. Carson wants to raise the federal minimum wage. You have called it a lame idea. Why is raising the federal minimum wage lame? I said the best way to help people see their wages go up is to get them the education, the skills they need to take on careers that pay far more than minimum wage. And it's why we talk about it. it's all about jobs. You want to help people actually get jobs. It's why on that last question we're trying to jump in on taxes. To me, it's not just about taxes, cutting taxes. I've done it as much as anybody. I've cut income taxes. I've cut property taxes. In fact, property taxes are lower today in my state than they were before we took office. The real issue is about jobs. Ronald Reagan, our plan is based on the Ronald Reagan tax cuts of 1986. That brought about one of the longest sustained periods of economic growth in American history. All the things we should be talking about tonight are about how do we create jobs, helping people get the skills and the education qualifications they need to succeed. That's the way you help people create jobs. It's part of our larger plan to reform the tax code, to cut taxes, uh, to put, uh, uh, put in place an education system that gives people the skills and education that they need, to put in place an all the above energy policy. But you start on day one with repealing Obamacare. I'm the only one on the stage who's actually got a plan, introduced an actual plan to repeal Obamacare on day one, I'll send a bill up to Congress and to make sure they actually enact it. Thank I'm you, Governor. Sign, I'm going to sign an order that makes the Congress live by the same rules as everybody else. Thank you, Governor. That will ensure they repeal Dr. Obamacare. Dr. Carson, Governor Walker didn't really answer the question, but I'll let you respond. He called yeah. raising the federal minimum wage lame. What do you think of that? Well, first of all, let me say what I actually said about raising the minimum wage. Uh, I was asked, should it be raised? I said, probably or possibly. But what I added, which I think is the most important thing, is I said we need to get both sides of this issue to sit down and talk about it, negotiate a reasonable minimum wage, and index that so that we never have to have this conversation again in the history of America. I think we also have to have two minimum wages, a starter and a sustaining. Because how are young people ever going to get a job if you have such a high minimum wage that it, it, it makes it impractical to hire them. Thank you, Dr. Jake, Carson. Jake, I want to now turn Jake, to Hugh. I want Jake, to turn just to that, Hugh. that issue, because you Go said ahead. I didn't answer, and I did. I said, to me, I think the real focus shouldn't be, you know, Hillary Clinton talks about the minimum wage. That's her answer to grow the economy. 
The answer is to get people the skills and the education so they make far more than minimum wage. I don't want to argue about how low things are going to be. I want to talk about how do we lift everyone up in America. That's what Reagan talked about. It wasn't how bad things were. It was how to make it better for everyone. That's what we've done in Wisconsin. That's exactly what we do. As Let president. me bring in our partner from Salem Radio Network, Hugh Hewitt. I'd like to talk about winning because I think all of you are more qualified than former Secretary of State Clinton and as were the people in the first debate. But there are different styles. And uh, Carly Fiorina, Governor Kasich, you are conveniently located next to each other and you have different styles. Governor Kasich, you've been on my show a lot. You refuse to attack Hillary Clinton. You just don't want to go there. You want to do the up with people, go Ohio campaign. And I like that. Carly Fiorina, I don't have to bring up the Secretary of State. <laughs> you bring her up, Sue Esponte. Which one of you is wrong, Governor Kasich? Well, look, I'm... People still have to get to know me, so I want to spend my time talking about my experience reforming welfare, balancing budgets, cutting taxes, providing economic growth when I was in Washington, turning Ohio around, $8 billion in the hole, $2 billion surplus, up over 300,000 jobs, big tax cuts, uh, strengthening our credit. All those things matter. But, you know, I, I, as a young man, uh, in my first election in 1978, I defeated an incumbent Democrat. I defeated an incumbent Democrat in 1982, running on the Reagan program. I was the only Republican in America to defeat an incumbent Democrat that year. And then when I uh, won for election to governor, I was the first Republican to defeat an incumbent in 36 years. And the first person to have never run statewide, out of politics for 10 years, to beat an incumbent, that hadn't happened for 96 years. So we'll get to the point where we'll talk about Hillary Clinton or whoever the nominee is record. But right now, I want to give people a sense of hope, a sense of purpose, a sense of unity, a sense that we can do it. So, um, you Governor. know, you at the end of the day, I'm going to continue to talk about my record because there's, do you ever notice when people run for office, they run for president, they make a lot of promises, they don't keep them. Thank I don't you, intend Governor. to do that. And I'm going to be out there pushing and I'll, don't worry about me and Hillary. That'll all work out. And I'm from Ohio. She will not beat me there, I can promise you that. Carly Fiorina, your style. You see, Governor Christie, people spend a lot of time talking about their track records, and Mr. Trump and I have every right to do the same. And Mrs. Clinton is going to have to defend her track record, her track record of lying about Benghazi, of lying about her emails, about lying about her servers. She does not have a track record of accomplishment. Like Mrs. Clinton, I too have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles around the globe. But unlike Mrs. Clinton, I know that flying is an activity. It is not an accomplishment. <laughs> Mrs. Clinton, if you want to stump a Democrat, ask them to name an accomplishment of Mrs. Clinton's. Thank you, Ms. Fiorina. Governor Christie, your name was mentioned. I want to give you a chance to respond. Listen, you know, Hugh, it's, a, it's an important point. And the question is, who's going to prosecute Hillary Clinton? The Obama White House seems to have no interest. The Justice Department seems to have no interest. I think it's time to put a former federal prosecutor on the same stage with Hillary Clinton, and I will prosecute her during those debates on that stage for the record that we're talking about here. The fact that she had a private email server in her basement using national security secrets running through it could have been hacked by the Russians, the Chinese, or two 18-year-olds on a toot wanting to have some fun. No one's answering that question from the Hillary Clinton clamp. You know you, why? Because she knows she's wrong and she cannot look in the mirror at herself and she cannot tell the American people the truth. Thank you, Governor Christie. There is a whole lot more coming up ahead. A world of trouble. The challenges that one of these candidates may face in the Oval Office and how he or she will handle it. Stay with us. Welcome back to CNN's Republican presidential debate. Let's turn to some issues now in foreign policy. Mr. Trump, Senator Rubio said it was, quote, very concerning to him that in a recent interview you didn't seem to know the details about some of the enemies the U.S. faces. Rubio said, if you don't know the answers to those questions, you will not be able to serve as commander-in-chief. Please respond to Senator Rubio. Well, I heard you, Hewitt, a nice man. He apologized because he actually said that we had a misunderstanding, and he said today that Donald Trump is maybe the best interview there is anywhere that he's ever done. Now, unless he was just saying that on CNN to be nice, but he did say that. Oh, well, you're the best statement? interview in America. And we had a legitimate misunderstanding in terms of his pronunciation of a word, but uh, I would say just, <laughs> well, I think it was. And he actually said that. Did you say that? And so Radio together. makes an interesting thing. Okay, so uh, I will say this, though. Uh, you was giving me name after name 
Arab name, Arab name. Arab. And there are few people anywhere, anywhere, that would have known those names. I think he was reading them off a sheet. And frankly, I will have, and I told him, I will have the finest team that anybody's put together, and we will solve a lot of problems. You know, right now, they know a lot, and look at what's happening. The world is blowing up around us. We will have great teams and great people. So I hope that answers yeah. your question. I mean, you are, on, you are in the Senate, but I hope yeah. that answers your question. Well, it does, but then it's the following way. This is an important question. I think if you're running for president, these are important issues, because look around the world today. There is a lunatic in North Korea with dozens of nuclear weapons and a long-range rocket that can already hit the very place in which we stand tonight. The Chinese are rapidly expanding their military. They hack into our computers. They're building artificial islands in the South China Sea, the most important shipping lane in the world. A gangster in Moscow is not just threatening Europe. He's threatening to destroy and divide NATO. You have radical jihadists in dozens of countries across multiple continents, and they even recruit Americans using social media to, to try to attack us here at home. And now we've got this horrible deal with Iran where a radical Shia cleric with an apocalyptic vision of the future is also guaranteed to one day possess nuclear weapons and also a long-range rocket that can hit the United States. These are extraordinarily dangerous times that we live in. And the next president of the United States better be someone that understands these issues and has good judge judgment about them. Because the number one issue that a president will ever confront and the most important obligation that the federal government has is to keep this nation safe. And today, we are not doing that. We are eviscerating our military, and we have a president that is more respectful to the Ayatollah in Iran than he is to the Prime Minister of Israel. Mr. Trump, <laughs> Senator Rubio seemed to be suggesting that you don't know information. No, I don't that think he's suggesting that at all. I mean, are I you, just Senator Rubio? I don't think he's well, suggesting that. Well, that's why we have that. a debate. I think that we should have a deeper debate about these issues because there is no more important decision that a president will make. But are you saying that you have in, uh, the knowledge to be the president that Mr. Trump does well, not that's have? What this, well, you should ask him questions in detail about the foreign policy issues our president will confront because you better be able to lead our country on the first day. Not six months from now, not a year from now, on the first day in office, our president could very well confront a national security crisis. You can't predict it. Sometimes you cannot control it. And it is the most, the federal government does all kinds of things it's not supposed to be doing. It regulates bathrooms. It regulates schools that belong to, to, to local communities. But the one thing that the federal government must do, the one thing that only the federal government can do is keep us safe. And a president better be up to date on those issues on his first day in office, or on her first day in office. Mr. Trump. Well, you have to understand, I am not sitting in the United States Senate with, by the way, the worst voting record there is today, uh, number one. I am not sitting in the United States Senate. I'm a businessman doing business me, I transactions. Okay. I am doing business transactions. I will know more about this, and as you said, that was very acceptable. And when you listened to that whole interview, it was a great interview. You said it, I didn't. Yeah. Well, he, now he, I did. No, but I will, listen, just oh, one second. Well, but he addressed just one these. second. I never get addressed, I so when know, I do, I'm going to jump in. I will right. know more about the problems of this world by the time I sit. And you look at what's going on in this world right now by people that supposedly know this world is a mess. Senator Rubio, he did yeah, invoke your absentee me, record in the I'm Senate. I'm proud to serve in the United States Senate. You know, when I ran five years ago, the entire leadership of my party in Washington lined up against me. But I'm glad I won, and I'm glad that I ran, because this country's headed in the wrong direction. And if we keep electing the same people, nothing is going to change. And you're right, I have missed some votes, and I'll tell you why, Mr. Trump. Because in my years in the Senate, I figured out very quickly that the political establishment in Washington, D.C., in both political parties, is completely out of touch with the lives of our people. You have millions of people in this country living paycheck to paycheck, and nothing's being done about it. We are about to leave our children with $18 trillion in, in, in debt, and they're about to raise the debt limit again. We have a world that grows increasingly dangerous, and we are eviscerating our military spending and signing deals with Iran. And these, if this thing continues, we are going to be the first Americans to leave our children worse off than ourselves. That's why I'm missing votes, because I am leaving the Senate, I'm not running for re-election, and I'm running for president, because I know this. Unless we have the right president, we cannot make America fulfill its potential. But with the right person in office, the 21st century can be the greatest era that our nation has ever known. Thank you, Senator Rubio. I want to turn now to Hugh Hewitt. Thank you, Jake. I've done a lot of great interviews with all of you, but Governor Bush, I talked to you in February about the biggest elephant in a room full of elephants, which is your last name. And you told me that you would not be burdened either by your brother or your father's legacy in the Middle East. And then a week later, you rolled out your list of foreign policy advisors, and it was a lot of the band getting back together again. So on behalf of the military that is watching, yeah. okay, the active duty military that are at the end of the spear, 
What kind of a commander in chief is Jeb Bush going to be, and who are the advisors that are new to your team? Well, first of all, Hugh, if you're looking at Republican advisors, you have to go to the last two administrations that happen to be 41 and 43. So just by definition, if you're, and many of the people here that are seeking advice from the foreign policy experts in the Republican side, they, they served in my dad's administration, my brother's administration. Of course that's the case. But I'm my own man. I'm going to create a strategy that's based on the simple fact that the United States needs to lead the world. The first thing that we need to do is to stop the craziness of the sequester, rebuild our military so that our so that we don't deploy people over and over again without the necessary equipment to keep them safe to send a signal to the world that we're serious. If we're going to lead the world, then we need to have the strongest military possible. We need to rebuild our counterintelligence and intelligence capabilities. We need to focus on the fact that the next president is going to start in 2017, not in 1990, you know, 30 years ago, or when my brother started. The world is dramatically different. And I believe that we need to restore America's presence and leadership in the world. Name a country where our relationship is better today than it was the, the day that Barack Obama got elected president. Under Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, we have seen a weakness that now creates huge problems for the next president of the United States. So I'll have a team that will be, that will be following the doctrine that I set up, and it'll be peace through strength. We're sitting here in this library, which is a wonderful place to talk about this, because that's exactly what happened in the 1980s, and the world was a lot safer because of the leadership of Ronald Mr. Reagan Mr. and Mr. my Trump. I, 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 I want to ask you a question, though. You've promised us great leaders, and I believe that, but Jeb Bush has laid out 20 different people that have experience around the world. There are 190 countries. You can't run the world by yourself. When are we going to get some names on your military and your foreign Very policy soon, advisors? And I'm meeting with people that are terrific people, but I have to say something because it's about judgment. I am the only person on this dais, the only person that fought very, very hard against us, and I wasn't a sitting politician, going into Iraq. Because I said going into Iraq, that was in 2003, you can check it out, check out, I'll give you 25 different stories. In fact, a delegation was sent to my office to see me because I was so vocal about it. I'm a very militaristic person, but you have to know when to use the military. I am the only person up here that fought against going into Iraq. Hugh, now, can I, can now, I make a response to just that? Just excuse me, one second, can Randy. I make you a don't mind, to Randy. That? You know, you are on the list. You, you do have your 1%. I would like, and I think it's very important, I think it's important because it's about judgment. It's about judgment. I didn't want to go into Iraq, and I fought it. Because what I said to you, May what I, I said, was you're going to, to destabilize the Middle East, me. and that's what happened. So He's you, referred to me no, in the first remarks. Chance, May I make a response? At, right after me. Go ahead, I'll, I'll yield, my, yield the floor. What do you guys say in the Senate when you're talking and debating? Absolutely. Go Whatever. ahead. Here's the fact. When Donald Trump talks about judgment, what was his position on who would have been the best negotiator to deal with Iran? It wasn't a Republican. It was Hillary Clinton. That's what you believe. I mean, the lack of judgment and the lack of understanding about how the world works is really dangerous in this kind of time that we're saying. So is that the judgment that well, you look, bring to the look, table, that Hillary Clinton is a great negotiator, it, that she could bring about a better your deal brother in Iran? And your brother's administration gave us Barack Obama because it was such a disaster those last three months that Abraham Lincoln couldn't have been elected. You know what? As it relates to my brother, there's one thing I know for sure. He kept us safe. I don't know if you remember, Donald. You remember the, the rubble? You remember the firefighter with his arms around it? He sent a clear signal that the United States would be strong and fight Islamic terrorism, and he did keep us safe. I don't know. You feel safe right now? I don't feel so safe. May no, I and that's because of Barack. That's because of Barack <laughs> Obama. Of my that's because of Barack Obama. We've had a president who called ISIS the JV squad, Yemen a success story, Iran a place we can do business with. It's not because of George W. Bush. It's because of Barack Obama. And when it, and, 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 and when it but, but here on that on, on that point though, whether it's whether we're talking about national security, foreign policy. Or we're talking about domestic policy. Or the, the collapse issue, of the economy. The key issue here is talking about leadership. Now, there's a lot of great people up here, and you've heard a lot of great ideas out there. But I would ask the American people, look at who's been tested. 
When there were 100,000 protesters in my capital, I didn't back down. When they issued death threats against me and threats against my family, I didn't back down. When they tried to recall me, I didn't back down. And when they made me the number one of their number one targets last year, I didn't back down. Give me the chance to be your president. Thank you, Governor. I won't back down Senator, on any of these issues. Senator Paul. The remark was made that there hadn't been anyone else on the podium opposed to the Iraq war. I've made my career as being an opponent of the Iraq war. I was opposed to the Syrian war. I was opposed to arming people who are our enemies. Iran is now stronger because Hussein is gone. Hussein was the great bulwark and counterbalance to uh, the Iranians. So when we complain about the Iranians, you need to remember that the Iraq war made it worse. Originally, Governor Bush was asked, was the Iraq war a mistake? And he said, no, we'd do it again. We have to learn sometimes the interventions backfire. The Iraq war backfired and did not help us. We're still paying the repercussions of a bad decision. We have Senator to make the decision now in Syria. Should we topple Assad? Many up here wanted to topple Assad, and it's like yeah. I said no because Thank if you, you do, Paul. ISIS Thank, will now be in charge. Thank you, Senator Paul. No, Gov I, talk, let me I understand that Governor Bush's name has been invoked, and then we can go to you, Senator Rubio. Here's the lessons of history. When we, we pull back, voids are created. We left Iraq. We should have had a, a forces agreement to stay there with a small force, and instead of that, we politically and militarily pull back, and now we have the creation of ISIS. 36 days ago, in this very library, I gave a speech with a comprehensive strategy how to take out ISIS. And it requires American leadership and engagement. We don't have to be the world's policeman, but we certainly have to be the world's leader. We need to have, make sure that the world knows that we're serious, that we're engaged, that we're not going to pull back, that, that, our, that our word matters. And if we do that, we can create a force that will take out ISIS both in Iraq uh, and in Syria, which will take a lot longer you, time now because of what President Obama's done by pulling Thank back. You, I want to go even Rubio. deeper, and I right. want to go even deeper in that direction because I think the belief that somehow by retreating America makes the world safer has been disproven every single time it's ever been tried. Syria is a perfect example of it. The uprising in Syria was not started by the United States; it was started by the Syrian people. And I warned at the time. This was three and a half years ago. I openly and repeatedly warned that if we did not find moderate elements on the ground that we could equip and arm, that void would be filled by radical jihadists. Well, the president didn't listen. The administration didn't follow through. And that's exactly what happened. That is why ISIS grew. That is why ISIS then came over the border from Syria and back into Iraq. What is happening in that region is the direct consequence of the inability to lead and of disengagement. And the more we disengage, the more airplanes from Moscow you're going to see flying out of Damascus and out of Syria. Thank you, Senator. As you asked earlier today. Jake, Jake, hey. Dr. Carson. Uh, I haven't had an opportunity to weigh in on foreign policy. And I just want to uh, mention that uh, when the war, uh, when the issue occurred in 2003, I suggested to President Bush uh, that he not go to war. Okay, so I, I just want that on the record. And, you know, a lot of people are very much against us getting involved right now uh, with global jihadism. And they, they, they refer back to our invasion of Iraq, and they seem to think that that was what caused it. What caused it was withdrawing from there and uh, creating a vacuum, which allowed this terrible situation to occur. But it's very different from what's going on today. We're talking about global jihadists who actually want to destroy us. They are an existential threat to our nation. And we have to be mature enough to recognize that our children will have no future if we put our heads in the sands. We have to recognize we have two choices. We either allow them to continue to progress and appear to be the winners, or we use every resource you, available Carson. to us to destroy them. You know, it's first. interesting that you say that because I want to ask uh, Governor Christie about something else uh, that you have said. Uh, Governor Christie, we just marked the 14th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. Now, Dr. Carson has said uh, that if he had been president at the time, the United States would not have gone to war in Afghanistan. What does that say to you about how Dr. Carson would respond as president if America were attacked again? Well, Jake, uh, I was named U.S. Attorney by President Bush on September 10th, 2001. And that next day, my wife, Mary Pat, did what she did every day. She traveled through the World Trade Center and went to her office two blocks from the World Trade Center. And after those planes hit for five and a half hours after that, I couldn't reach her, didn't know whether she was dead or alive, and we had three children at that time, eight, five, and one. And I had to confront what so many thousands of others in my region had to confront. The idea that I might become a single parent, the idea that my life and my children's life might be changed forever. We lost friends that day. We went to the funerals. And I will tell you that what those people wanted and what they deserved 
was for America to answer back against what had been done to them. And I support what President Bush did at that time, going into Afghanistan, hunting al-Qaeda and its leaders, getting its sanctuary out of place, and making it as difficult around the world for them to move people and money. And then he went to prosecutors like us, and he said, never again, don't prosecute these people after the crime is committed, intervene before the crime happens. I absolutely believe that what the president did at the time was right, and I am proud to have been one of the people on the stage who was part of making sure that what Governor Bush said before was the truth. America was safe for those seven years, and Barack Obama has taken that safety away from us. Dr. Carson. Well, recognize that, you know, President George W. Bush was a great friend of, of ours, and we spent many wonderful days uh, at the White House. I, I haven't been there in the last seven years. I'd probably have to have a food tester. But at any rate, um, you know, I didn't suggest that nothing be done. What I suggested to President Bush is to be Kennedy-esque in the sense that when the Russians got ahead of us in the space race, what we did is used a bully pulpit to galvanize everybody business, industry, academia behind a national goal to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely. I said, you can do the same kind of thing. Declare that within five to ten years we will become petroleum independent. The moderate Arab states would have been so concerned about that, they would have turned over Osama bin Laden and anybody else you wanted on a silver platter within two weeks. There are smart ways to do things and there are muscular ways to do things and sometimes you have to look at uh, both of those to come up with Jake. the right solution. Jake. Jake, I, I don't want to say, I don't say this, Jake, is that while that may have been a fine idea um, that Dr. Carson had, these people were out to kill us. I stood in that region with my family, and every time a plane went overhead in the weeks after that, people's heads jerked to the sky because they thought it was happening again. You do not need to go through subtle diplomacy at that point. That can be handled later on. What you need is a strong American leader who will take the steps that are necessary to protect our nation. That's what I would do as commander in chief in this circumstance, and that's what President George W. Bush did in, in 2001. Dr. Carson. I have no argument with having a strong leader and to be aggressive where aggression is needed but it's not needed in every circumstance. There is a time when you can use your intellect to come up with other ways to do things, and I think that's what we have to start thinking about. There is no question that a lot of these problems that we have been talking about in terms of the international situation is because we are weak. It's because our Navy is so small. It's because our Air Force is incapable of doing the same things that it did a few years ago. It's because our Marine Corps is not ready to be deployed. Thank there you, are a lot of problems that are going on, and we need to solve those problems. We need Thank to you, build Dr. up Thanks. our Radical military. Radical terrorism cannot be solved by, by intellect. It cannot, they, they require, they, what they need is they need an operating space. That's what Afghanistan was for Al-Qaeda. It was a vacuum that they filled, and they created an operating space. That's why they had to be drawn out of there. That's how they had to be destroyed. It is the reason why ISIS has now grown as well. We allowed them, we allowed a vacuum to emerge in Syria. They used it as an operating space to grow. And today, they're not just in Iraq and Syria anymore. They're now in Libya conducting operations in the Sinai. They're now in Afghanistan trying to supplant the Taliban as the most powerful uh, radical jihadist group on the ground there as well. You cannot allow radical jihadists to have an operating safe Thank haven you, anywhere in the world. Okay. Governor Huckabee, just today, just today there was a new report that 50 different intelligence analysts have said that what they sent up the ladder was doctored by senior officials so that they could give some happy talk to the situation that we face. I love the idea of a, of a good intellectual capacity to deal with our enemies, but the fact is if you don't have good intelligence that's reliable and it's honest, you're not going to have good intelligence and you cannot make good decisions. The next president is primarily elected not just to know things, but to know what to do with the things that he knows. And the most dangerous person in any room is the person who doesn't know what he doesn't know. Thank you, and Governor. And the reason Barack Obama has been dangerous to this country, and we'd better elect someone who has had some executive experience, 
is because we cannot afford another eight years having a person in the office who doesn't know what he does not Thank know. Thank you, Governor. I want to turn, I want to, turn to ISIS. Point. Governor Walker. We just point. spent the last 10 minutes. Governor points. Walker, uh, there is a big debate right now. We've been talking about ISIS here and there about this in this discussion. There's a big debate right now about whether or not to send more U.S. troops to fight ISIS in Iraq and Syria. In the first debate earlier, earlier this evening, Senator Lindsey Graham <clears throat> argued that candidates are only serious about fighting ISIS if they are willing to send 10,000 U.S. troops to Iraq, 10,000 U.S. troops as part of a coalition to Syria. Governor Walker, you say, you just told me a few days ago, that the 3,000 U.S. troops there right now are enough as long as the rules of engagement are changed. What do you know that Senator Graham doesn't know? No, to be clear, what I said the other day was that we need to lift the political restrictions that are already in play. Barack Obama's administration has put political restrictions on the military personnel already in Iraq. We need to lift those, and then we need to listen to our military experts, not the political forces in the White House, but our military experts about how many more we send in. And we certainly shouldn't have a commander in chief who sends a message to our adversaries as to how far we're going to go and how far we're willing to fight. So I'm not putting a troop number on. What I'm saying is lift the political restrictions. When you do that, you empower our military personnel already there to work with the Kurd and the Sunni allies to reclaim the territory taken by ISIS and to do so in a way that allows that ISIS doesn't go back in Syria, as we were just talking about here. That is the fundamental problem going forward. We have a president, and Hillary Clinton, who was a part of this, by the way, who has made political decisions for our men and women in uniform. I want the men and women at home to know if I am commander-in-chief, I will only send you into harm's way when our national security is at risk. And if we do, you know you'll have our full support, the support of the American people, and you'll have a clear path for victory. Thank you, Jay. Governor. Senator you? Paul, I want to go to you because you have said that the boots on the ground to fight ISIS need to be Arab boots. Uh, we just learned today that despite the Obama administration spending $500 million to help create those Arab boots, there are only four or five U.S. trained fighters in Syria fighting ISIS. What does that say to you about the effectiveness of the idea of the boots on the ground need to be Arab boots? If you want boots on the ground and you want them to be our sons and daughters, you got 14 other choices. There will always be a Bush or Clinton for you if you want to go back to war in Iraq. But the thing is, the first war was a mistake, and I'm not sending our sons and our daughters back to Iraq. The war didn't work. We can amplify those who live there. The Kurds deserve to be armed, and I'll arm them. We can use our Air Force to amplify the forces there, but the boots on the ground need to be the people who live there. My goodness, I'm still upset with the Saudi Arabians for everything they do over there. They've funded the arms that went to the jihadists. They're not accepting any of the people, any of the migrants that have been the refugees that are being pushed out of Syria. Saudi Arabia is not accepting one. Why are we always the world's patsies that we have to go over there and fight their wars for them? They need to fight their wars. We need to defend American interests, but it's not in America's national security interest Thank you, to have another war in Iraq. We're going to turn to some domestic issues now. I want to bring in my colleague, Dana Bass. Can I, can I, uh, Jay, can I just make one point on this whole military sure. discussion? I called for boots on the ground many months ago in a coalition with our friends who share our interests. You know, you win a battle with the military. And when we go somewhere, we need to be mobile and lethal, we need to take care of business, and we need to come home. But we face also a bigger war, and, that, and you win the bigger war with the battle of ideas. You wonder why young people and educated people, rich people, schooled people, have tried to join ISIS. Western civilization, all of us, need to wake up to the fact that those murderers and rapists need to be called out, and in Western civilization, we need to make it clear that our faith in the Jewish and Christian principles force us to live a life bigger than ourselves, to Thank be you, sinners Governor. in justice, so that we can battle the radicals, call them out for what they are, and make sure that all of our people feel fulfilled in living in Western civilization. Thank you, Governor. This is a giant Jay, battle since, in the world since today. Since everyone has gotten to weigh in on this military issue, I'd like to be able to do the same. We have spent probably 12 minutes talking about the past. Let's talk about the future. 
We need the strongest military on the face of the planet, and everyone has to know it. And specifically what that need means is we need about 50 army brigades, we need about 36 marine battalions, we need somewhere between 300 and 350 naval ships, we need to upgrade every leg of the nuclear triad, we need Thank to reform you, the Department of Defense, Thank we you. need as well Thank to you. invest Thank in you, our Ms. military we're going technology. To turn to we're going to turn to domestic issues and now we Dana need to Bass. care for our veterans so 307,000 of Bash. them aren't dying waiting for health care. Thank you. Dana Bash. Governor Bush, let's talk about an issue that's very important to Republican voters and that's the Supreme Court. Uh, after Chief Justice John Roberts voted to uphold Obamacare twice, Senator Cruz criticized your brother for appointing John Roberts to the Supreme Court. Looking back on it, did your brother make a, mis a mistake? Well, I'm surprised Senator Cruz would say that since he was a strong supporter of John Roberts at the time. I, look, I, I will talk about what I will do as President of the United States as it relates to appointing Supreme Court justices. We need to make sure that we have justices that with a proven, experienced record of respect for upholding the Constitution. That is what we need. We can't have the history in recent past is appoint people that have no experience so that you can't get attacked. And that makes it harder for people to have confidence that they, they won't veer off on decisions. Is John Roberts one of those people? John Roberts has made some really good decisions, for sure. But he did not have a proven, extensive record that would, made, would, would have made clarity the important thing. And that's what we need to do. And I'm willing to fight for those nominees to make sure that they get passed. You can't do it the politically expedient way anymore. This is the, po the culture in Washington. You have to fight hard for these appointments. This is perhaps the most important thing that the next president will do. Do you like what you just heard, Senator Cruz? Well, Dan, I've known John Roberts for 20 years. He's an amazingly talented lawyer. But yes, it was a mistake when he was appointed to the Supreme Court. He's a good enough lawyer that he knows in these Obamacare cases, he changed the statute, he changed the law in order to force that failed law on millions of Americans for a political outcome. And, you know, we're frustrated as conservatives. We keep winning elections, and then we don't get the outcome we wanted. Let me focus on two moments in time. Number one, in 1990, in one room was David Souter, in another room was Edith Jones, the rock rib conservative on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. George Herbert Walker Bush appointed David Souter. And then in 2005, in one room was John Roberts, in another room was my former boss, Mike Ludig, the rock rib conservative on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Thank you, Senator. George W. Bush appointed John Roberts. And let me give you the consequences of that. If instead the President Bushes had appointed Edith Jones and Mike Ludig, which is who I would have appointed, <laughs> Obamacare would have been struck down three years ago, and the marriage laws of all 50 states would be on the books. These matter, and I've fought to defend the Constitution my whole life, and Governor I will Bush, as president as well. I want to let you respond. Well, first of all, he, as I said, he supported John Roberts. He supported him publicly. So you can rewrite history, I guess, Ted, but the simple fact is that you supported him because he had uh, all the criteria that you would, have, you would have thought would have made a great justice. And I think he is doing a good job. But the simple fact is, going forward, what we need to do is to have someone that has a long-standing set of uh, rulings that consistently makes it clear that he is focused exclusively on upholding the Constitution of the United States, that they, they won't try to use the bench as a means by which to, to legislate. And that's what we should do. Thank and you, I Governor. hope I'll be working with members of the United States Senate to fight hard for the passage of people that have that kind of qualification. Sen Senator Cruz, 30 seconds. It is true that after George W. Bush nominated John Roberts, oh. I supported his confirmation. That was a mistake, and I regret that. I wouldn't have nominated John Roberts, and indeed, Governor Bush pointed out why. It wasn't that the President Bushes wanted to appoint a liberal to the court. It's that it was the easier choice. Both David Souter and John Roberts, they didn't have a long paper trail. If you'd nominated Edith Jones or Mike Ludig, you would have had a bloody fight, and they weren't willing to spend political capital to put a strong judicial conservative on the court. I have spent my entire life, starting from clerking for Chief Justice William Rehnquist on the United States Supreme Court, one of the most principled jurists, we have an out-of-control court. And I give you my word, if I'm elected president, every single Supreme Court justice will faithfully follow the law and will not act like philosopher kings you, imposing Senator. their liberal policies on millions you, of Americans who need to be trusted to govern ourselves. Thank you, Senator. Governor Huckabee, I want to bring you in very quickly, if you could. 
Will you have a litmus test when it comes to appointing Supreme Court nominees? You better believe I will, because I'm tired of liberals always having a litmus test and conservatives are supposed to pretend we don't. Well, let me tell you what mine would be. Number one, I'd ask, do you think that the unborn child is a human being or is it just a blob of tissue? I'd want to know the answer to that. I'd want to know, do you believe in the First Amendment? Do you believe that religious liberty is the fundamental liberty around which all the other freedoms of this country are based? And I'd want to know, do you really believe in the Second Amendment? Do you believe that we have an individual right to bear arms, to protect ourselves and our family, and to protect our country? And do you believe in the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment? Do you believe that a person, before they're deprived of life and liberty, should in fact have due process and equal protection under the law? Because if you do, you're going to do more than defund Planned you, Parenthood. Governor. One final thing. I'd make darn sure that we absolutely believe the Tenth Amendment. Every governor on this stage would share this much with you. Every one of us. Our biggest fight wasn't always with the legislature or even with the Democrats. My gosh, half the time it was with the federal government who apparently never understood Thank that you. if it's not reserved in the Constitution, then the Tenth Amendment says it's left to the states, but somebody forgot Thank to send you, a memo to Washington. Thank you, Governor. Now, we're going to take a quick break. Coming up, one of the hottest questions that you have been asking us via social media, we will pose it to the candidates. That's coming up right after this.